Right, so we're going to continue on uh, the lecture now about Newton's second law. Uh, basically, I'm just going to do a couple of examples that I've found uh, that are in your notes as well. I will post the uh, chapter five notes later today as well. Um, there's not a whole lot there. Uh, it's effectively just more examples. Uh, you should be working on the homeworks uh, and be able to get through this next section uh, by Friday at midnight. Uh, the next section is going to uh, start talking about rotational motion. We've talked about things operating linearly. Uh, and so starting in the next section, we're going to talk about things moving in a circle, which is actually a little more interesting, I think. So let's get started. Oops, let me adjust the camera here. That's a little more better. And move that over that way a little bit. Okay. So let's set up a problem. This is a problem that's in your notes. Uh, pretty straightforward, I think. So remember, um, I just got this pen too. Uh, remember, I'm a physicist. I am not an artist. And here we have a guy. And the guy is standing on some tightrope at some distance. And sucks. At some distance, H above the ground. And let's say that while he stands on this tightrope, the rope makes some angle theta with the horizontal. So, what we want to know is we would like to find. What is the tension in the string? So again, the same assumptions that we've been making are going to apply. Uh, we're not concerned about the mass of the rope. We're not concerned about if this thing is kind of swinging around due to gravity or wind or something. It doesn't matter. All we care about is uh, this. Just this guy standing on the rope. Now, in reality, if you were to actually look at this, what you would get is more of a parabola kind of shape. It turns out that's pretty hard to deal with. And we're going to need some variational calculus. So that's why we're not going to do that. We're just going to assume nice straight angles. So if we'd like to know the tension, then we're going to have to label a few things here. So we know that there's going to be some weight. Since we have a, a point of contact, there must be a normal force. And we know that this angle exists this theta. So remember, this is all about forces. Tension is just another force. So anytime we see tension, anytime we see a question that asks us to calculate the force somewhere, we're always going to be using Newton's second law. Some of the forces is the mass times acceleration. Now, if we imagine this state, we know that there is no motion up and down. Okay, we're not bouncing on this rope. And we know that we're not moving side to side. So we know these tensions have to be equal. So that makes this equation pretty easy. We already know because there's no motion up and down that the sum of the forces in the y direction must be zero. 
Well, we can prove that by saying some of the forces in the y direction, well, that's just got to be the weight force plus the normal force plus, don't forget, the tension force. Ah, but we have two tensions, right? We have T1 and T2. So we need a T1 and we need a T2. And because we're talking about two dimensions, remember the first thing we have to do is to break this thing down into X and Y components. So we're talking about the Y component of those tensions. Well, we know that F sub Y has got to equal the weight. Well, we know weight is just mass times the acceleration due to gravity. So we're gonna pick gravity acting in the positive direction downwards. We know this guy has some mass in kilograms, obviously. So we know the weight force is mg. There's no friction. Okay, notice I didn't put that in there. Now we know, if we want to be precise, certainly there is some small frictional force in either direction that's going to work in the same direction as the tension. But it's pretty easy to see that those are going to go away too. So let's not worry about them. We know that the normal force has got to be equal and opposite to the weight force. So the normal force is going to be minus weight. Now we haven't figured out what the tension forces are yet. But we can tell from the diagram that they must be equal, but opposite. So that means that the y direction of tension one has got to be the same as the negative of tension two. So we can just replace T2 with a negative T1. Weight is mg, then the negative of that's got to be minus mg plus t1y minus t1y. Everything cancels. Newton's second law tells me that the sum of the forces in the y direction has got to be equal to the total mass of the system times the acceleration in the y direction. Since we're not moving in the y direction, we would expect acceleration in the y direction to be zero. That gives us m times zero, which is zero as we expect. So we have a zero equals zero, that checks. So we've handled the y direction. Well, the x direction is going to be a little different, right? Because we've got these x and y things going on here. Well, now we need to worry about that tension a little bit more. So we're going to say that we need to look at the angle here. So let's set up a simple free body diagram. If we remove all of the lines and things and stop thinking about this in terms of ropes and things. We get a right triangle, we get an angle, and we know the magnitude of this force. So here's our angle. We have a right triangle, so we know that we can use trigonometry. And we can say that Here's an opposite, and here is 
uh, the opposite angle and or opposite side, right? So let's say that we know theta. So we know an angle on the side. So if we think back to our trig functions, we should recall that the trig function that uses the theta, the uh, trig function that uses the angle in an opposite side, well, what are we trying to find? We're trying to find this side. That's going to be our tension vector, right? So we want the hypotenuse. So we need something that has an angle, an opposite side, and a hypotenuse. That happens to be the tangent. Tangent's opposite over hypotenuse. We want the hypotenuse here. So we can rearrange this and we can say tan theta, the opposite side is our normal force and our hypotenuse is our tangent force. We want tangent or we want tension. So we can rearrange this and we can get that the tension is equal to the normal force divided by tan theta. Well, if we do some dimensional analysis, we find that the normal force is in Newtons, right? Because it's a force. Tan theta, that's a unitless thing. So we have something that looks like Newtons over just some constant value. And so that should result in something that looks like Newtons. Well, tension means, it's made, this means tension is measured in Newtons. Cool. Well, is that true? Has to be, right? Because tension is a force. All forces are measured in Newtons. So we get Newtons divided by some constant, returns Newtons, which is exactly what we expect. And now we know the tension. So what's the difference? In the other side, absolutely nothing. The only difference is our direction. The other side, you should go negative, right? Because remember, all we're talking about is direction when we talk about a negative sign. So we arbitrarily pick one side to be positive. That means the other direction has got to be the negative. As long as those two angles are the same, then the tension on either side must be the same. And so we've calculated it. So something really interesting happens here. Let's plug some numbers in here and see what happens. Just for the sake of argument. So we figured all this out. Okay, we know how the problem works. So now let's make some assumptions. Let's say that the mass of this guy is, I don't know, 100 kilograms. And let's say that the angle is five degrees from the horizontal. And we want to know what the tension is. Well, pretty simple. We've already done the math. So we need to know the normal force. So normal is just going to be the negative of the weight force, which is mg. Well, mass, we know, I said, was 100 kilograms. Gravity is 9.81 meters per second squared. So that gives me a normal force of negative 981 newtons. 
Again, because we picked gravity to be down and positive, had we chosen down to be negative, no big deal. It just means that this 9.81 would have a negative. You'd pick up an overall positive. Now, does that matter? No. Because really what we're looking at is the magnitude of the force in this case. So I don't really care. So we can kind of put absolute value signs around that if we want. But the point is that we now have 981 newtons of normal force, which is the same as the 981 newtons of weight force, just in the opposite direction. We know our theta is five degrees. So we can come over here and we can say T equals 981 over tangent five degrees. I don't know what that is off the top of my head. So you go to Google and calculate it. Point oh eight seven. So I now get something that looks like nine eight one five by point oh eight seven, and that works out to be uh, eleven two seventy five point eight. is the tension. That's interesting. So now it's where we have to be physicists, think like a physicist. Yes, I know it's scary. It causes me to wake up in nightmares every night. So we have a tension of roughly 11,000 newtons. And we have a weight or a normal force of roughly a thousand newtons. So we're talking about a tension here that's 10 times the weight of this guy. Well, that's kind of important to me if I'm an engineer, if I'm designing a system, I want to know what the strength of that rope is, right? I better have a rope that can withstand 11,000 newtons of force before it breaks, if I want this 100 kilogram guy to stand on top of it. Otherwise, he's gonna have a bad day. This is why, if you ever watch uh, documentaries or something on like Discovery Channel uh, or go look it up on YouTube. Watch videos of fighter aircraft landing on aircraft carriers. And aircraft carriers have uh, a system to stop those aircraft uh, because they come in really fast. And the flight deck of an aircraft carrier is relatively short. In fact, it's so short that if you just landed the airplane on the deck of the carrier, you wouldn't be able to stop in time. So you have to have something to help stop it. And the way they do that is they have what's called an arrestor hook or a tail hook, and it catches a wire on the flight deck that stretch across the deck. And it's a pretty big, thick cable. It's, I would say that cable is on the order of eight to 10 inches thick uh, and just, wound steel. So a fighter aircraft, let's say an F-18, uh, the F-18 has a gross weight at landing of, I think it's somewhere around 20,000 pounds. I haven't really worked on 18s, but they're a little bit bigger than an F-16. So that's probably a good estimate. So let's say your average 18, F-18 weighs about 20,000 pounds. And he lands and snags this cable. That cable can deflect quite a lot beyond five degrees. It works out to, I, I think on average, 
you get about a 10 to 12 degree uh, difference. But you can go work that out. It's exactly the same problem, right? Because now, if we just flip this to kind of look top down on it, it's now not a guy standing on a rope. It's just something pulling on this rope. Doesn't matter what it is. We know the angle and find this tension. You'll find out that the tension in that arrestor table on the aircraft carrier is very, very high. It's on the, measured in the order of tons. There have been accidents, and you can find them if you look hard enough on YouTube, where that cable has snapped. We're going to talk about energy in a little while. You probably all played with a rubber band, and at some point the rubber band breaks, and it goes flying and slaps you in the face, and it kind of stings. So imagine this giant wound steel cable snaps under tons and tons of pressure and starts flying around. You don't want to be anywhere near that. Uh, so you can find videos of this on YouTube. If you look hard enough, there's some gross ones where guys have been cut in half by this. So flight decks are very dangerous because of this principle. But notice that even though this might have looked intimidating to begin with, we didn't do anything new. We just set up some of the forces problem. Notice what I did. I set up some of the forces problem. I worked through the math. I was asked to find a tension. So I worked it through symbolically until I had an expression for tension. Then I gave you actual numbers to plug in, a mass and an angle. Having done that, then we already did the math. We already did the physics. This is 98% of the problem right here. We did the physics. Now we take our numbers, we do a quick calculation for our normal force. We plug in our angle to our trig function. And one step out pops the tension. Had I asked you now, let's say this was part A of a problem, and part B of the problem might be, well, what happens if the angle increases to 15 degrees? How much tension is there then? You don't have to go back and work the whole problem again. You've already got the formula you need. Just redo this calculation replacing theta. It would be easy at that point if you plotted on a piece of graph paper or using Mathematica or Maple or something, you could easily plot what this tension looks like at different angles. Now I'm getting somewhere, right? As an engineer, I would want to know what the optimal deflection angle is where I can carry the most weight but not break my cable. So a very useful thing to do. So this problem was pretty easy. Let's do another one. I think this is in the chapter five notes. And again, I'll post in a bit. So here we have our horizontal. And here we have a rope. We're gonna call that an angle theta. And we have another rope. We're going to call this angle alpha. And here we have some mass M. And it hangs thusly. So again, this looks like the tightrope problem. Except now our tensions are different. Hmm. So let's think about this problem. What I'd like to know is how much tension there is in each table. Obviously, they're going to be different. 
I would expect, since this one is shorter, this angle alpha is probably going to be larger the way I've drawn it. So I would expect that this tension here, this T2, is going to be closer to whatever the weight of this object is than this T1. It's certainly going to depend on the angle. So let's figure it out. Well, again, let's do this. Remember, we did the problem last time. That was kind of similar. And we just split this into two pieces. Call it side one and side two, just for the hell of it. So let's do the calculations. Let's do side one. Again, just drawing a free body diagram from this. That's got to be our normal force. That's got to be our tension one. And this has got to be our angle theta. Look at that, it looks exactly like the other problem. So we end up with something that looks like T1 equals the normal force over N theta. If we go over here and we do side two, let's draw our free body diagram again. Here's our alpha. Here's our tension. So T2, well, again, here's our normal force. That's got to be the same. And here's our tan theta. Whoops, not tan theta, it's tan alpha. But we know that this tan theta is going to be in the opposite direction. So we can put a negative there. Doesn't matter if you call the other direction negative, who cares? So now we have an expression for T1 and T2. If we wanted to find out how much bigger one was than the other, that's a simple ratio, right? Let's do T1 to T2. And that'll tell you which one's bigger by half as much, by twice as much, by three times as much, whatever you want. Well, let's plug some numbers in and let's figure this out. Let's say that the mass of our block is 10 kilograms. Let's say that angle theta is 10 degrees. And let's say that angle alpha is 45 degrees. Oh, let's go one, make sure that you guys can see this. So let's say T1 is our normal force. Well, we know our normal force is just minus mg and theta is 10 degrees. So 10, 10 degrees, m is 10. Let's just do some quick math. Let's assume that g is 10. So that's gonna be 100 Newtons and the negative and the tangent of 10 degrees. Again, I can't do trig in my head that quickly. Is 0.176. And over here, we know that our normal force has to be the same. Minus 100 Newtons. Don't forget our negative sign to indicate direction of T2. And then we have our tan 
of alpha. I said alpha was 45 degrees. Which should not be surprising. V1. That's interesting. Why should it be one? Think about what tangent really is. Tangent is the ratio of the sine to the cosine. If 45 degrees is half of 90, then you would expect sine and cosine to be pretty close to each other. Therefore, their ratios of cosine divided by sine should be pretty close to one. And that's exactly what tan 45 works out to be. Not surprising. So the map on this is out to be a mega by 100 newtons in that direction. And it was tan of 0.176, so 100. Works out to be 568, we'll call it 0.2. So that means that if you have this system, look what happened. We have our negative here. I forgot the negative. That went away. Got the negative here that showed up there. So notice we have one acting in the negative direction and one acting in the positive direction, as we expect, because we pick kind of left and right arbitrarily. So we find that T1 is about five and a half times more than T2. And I also made a prediction early on that because this thing is pretty close to here, it's pretty close to vertical, or at least closer to vertical than this one, that I would expect the tension T2 to be very, very close to the weight. Well, the weight, is just our 10 kilograms. And remember we said, we're gonna assume gravity to be 10, just to make the math easy. So that means that I should expect the weight of this thing to be 100 Newtons, and I should expect T2 to be pretty close to 100 Newtons, and it is. Now you can see how, if we start moving these angles around, that, you'll get different tensions. But if you think back to what we did on the last lecture, where these two angles were equal, where alpha and theta were equal, remember we really didn't have to do two equations because we'd already assumed symmetry. Well, what if I didn't do that? What if I told you each of these were 45 degrees? What if I said theta is 45 and alpha is 45? You could work it out, and what you would get is exactly what you would expect. The two tensions would be equal. Huh. So, nothing big. Just remember, you split this thing up into two different right triangle problems. I'm going to set up one more for you. I know this one is in the notes as well. I can't remember it's in four or five. Again, the chapter five notes that I'm gonna post uh, are really, really short and they generally are just practice problems, um, but it'll be all right. So there is a problem in the notes where you have a wall Again, I am not an artist. 
So we have a rock climber on the wall. And we say that there are two angles here. The rock climber is leaning against, is holding the rope with her feet braced on the wall. We know how much she weighs. We have this angle alpha. That's going to be the angle between the wall and the rope. We have this angle theta. That's the angle between her legs and the wall. They may not be the same. And we know the coefficient of friction against the wall. So we'd like to know where is she doing more work? Which one's harder or which one is carrying more of her weight? The rope or her feet against the wall? This shouldn't be that hard to figure out. Again, it's just a couple of right triangle problems. Well, let's start by drawing three body diagrams. If we take this top part, we got this angle alpha. Here's our right angle. Here's our alpha. If W is straight down, she is leaning back off the wall. W might not be straight down going to alpha. So W is gonna be some function of this theta. So what we're gonna to have to do is this kind of problem. This is gonna look like an inclined plane problem, right? Some theta, and here's our climber that represents the box. Here's our weight, and we wanna know that piece. So we know an angle. We know an opposite, so we want the adjacent. So that means our sign, right? So this vector has got to be M sine theta, which has got to be this. And if we know that, now we know an angle, we need the hypotenuse, and we have the adjacent side. So that's going to look like the cosine, right? So if we take plus alpha, that's adjacent over hypotenuse. Uh, oh, we need opposite over hypotenuse. So sine. Uh, the no, I do need adjacent over half on this side, cosine. The adjacent side is M sine theta. The hypotenuse is the tension. Rearrange, and we get tension equals M sine theta over cos alpha and work it out, right? Well, here, we'd wanna know the coefficient of friction, right? So I'd probably give that to you. And what we'd need to know is this force here, right? So we do the same thing, except we use our coefficient of friction. We do the math, we'll work it out. So notice what happens with this kind of problem is this ends up being two separate problems, right? Again, it's the same thing. You just split this into two halves, except there's our division right there instead of being vertical. 
But in order to find this side, right, we needed to know something about this alpha. So then, once we find this side, once we find this force, then we can compare that applied force to the tension force. And we can find out how much more of the weight is being supported by the friction versus the tension in the rope. I encourage you to play with that one a little bit. There's a couple of simulations online uh, that you can do if you look up um, tension calculators on Google. Uh, you can find a whole bunch of these. Somebody else has already coded that you can play with these angles and try to predict what's going to happen. I would think that the smaller alpha gets in order for this person to not fall down the mountain, this force has got to be bigger, right? Coefficient of friction has got to increase. But if I make alpha big, I'm getting more uh, tension in the rope. So the rope's supporting more of the weight. So that's what should work out. So again, I encourage you to play with this problem. Uh, you may see this problem or something similar to it again uh, in a couple of weeks when I do the next test. Uh, speaking of which, I have not quite decided uh, when to do the next test. I think I'm going to wait until after I get through with rotational motion, and then we'll cover uh, Newton's second law and these kind of inclined plane problems and rotational motion on the second test. And then I think the third test will do energy and momentum. And that should be enough to get us through the semester. So having said that, the usual caveats apply. If you need assistance, you know where to find me. Uh, I encourage you to be working on the homeworks and doing them not just all at the last minute, because as you can see, some of this gets a little nasty uh, and it's going to take some time. But that's also why I'm not making the homeworks a thousand problems long. So I encourage you to stay on top of the homeworks, do the problems, work these examples I give you in class, especially things like this, where I say that you might see these again. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink, say them all. Uh, and if you have questions, come and ask me, and I will see you guys in the next lecture.